Hi, Sergeant Paula Keller here from the New Britain Police Department's Animal Control Division. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Animal 411. So this here is Velvet. She's only been with us for a week and a half. She has an adoption pending, so she's going home today when her uh, new foster, her new adoptive mom gets out of work. So last week we talked about, in our last episode, we talked about what goes on at the animal control facility. We kind of give you a peek behind the curtain of what it is that we do on a daily basis for the dogs that we take in and the process that they go through. So what we wanted to expand upon this episode of Animal 411 is basic animal care and what constitutes animal neglect and animal cruelty. A lot of the calls that we get um, for calls for service that we get um, does have to do with suspected animal neglect and, and animal cruelty. Well, the first thing that we do is investigate. We're police officers and we investigate animal cruelty like any other crime because animal cruelty is a crime. Now, all of the animal cruelty uh, falls under the Connecticut General Statutes for animal cruelty. So it's going to cover everything from neglect, abuse, uh, torture, it even covers uh, dog fighting and cock fighting, and it also covers uh, service dogs that get assaulted or killed. So this one statute covers everything. So that's the statute that we look to when we're investigating animal cruelty to find out is what's occurring, does that fall under the statute? Is this something that we can actually arrest somebody for? Sometimes what happens is people just need basic education. So the reason why I brought little uh, Velvet here, ouch, and I can tell you she's got very long claws. So I don't know if you can see this or not, but she's got very, very long claws here. She's not had her nails cut. We actually did cut them a little bit since she's been here. And she's actually a little bit on the thin side. You can see her, her spine sticking out here. Um, her hips aren't showing anymore, but um, you know you can see her rib cage. She is a little bit on the thin side. I wouldn't say that she's emaciated, but she could stand to gain a couple pounds, and I'm sure she will once she gets into her new home. And she wants to get down now. OK. So we take a dog like Velvet and we see these conditions, okay, she's got the longer nails and she's a little bit on the thin side. We have to ask ourselves, is this something that we would make an arrest on? Is she suffering? Well, she doesn't really seem to be suffering. Could she be made more comfortable? Absolutely. So sometimes what we're looking to do is to just educate people. You can't let the nails get too long. If you can't clip them yourself, you do have to take them to a groomer or the veterinarian to get them clipped. And a lot of times, all of this stuff falls under basic veterinary care. If you're taking your animal to the veterinarian on a regular basis for an exam and for their vaccines, they're going to educate you and they're going to tell you, hey, the nails are too long, they need to be cut. She's a little on the thin side, how much are you feeding her? Maybe you need to feed her a little bit more. <clears throat> Maybe she needs to eat twice a day. So sometimes it's just a matter of education. So when does this neglect turn into a crime? Well, one of the biggest things that we see here in our city for neglect turning into a crime is when we have untreated flea infestations and untreated skin conditions on, the, on basically on dogs that flare up where the dog has scabs, oozing, bleeding, constant itching, bites, and hair loss. And it's on over a prolonged period of time. This kind of tells us that there's obvious physical signs that the dog is suffering and the person or the owner of the dog has failed to treat the dog for this suffering and it's gone on for a prolonged period of time. If the neglect is going on for a prolonged period of time without proof that the person has attempted to contact a veterinarian or taken the dog to a veterinarian or if they failed to provide proper flea medication for the dog, this can constitute neglect. If you know your dog is suffering, you have to take it to the veterinarian. You have to do something for the dog. Prolonged suffering is something that we consider a neglect and is something that we consider uh, an issue that we can make an arrest for. Other signs of abuse are obvious. When dogs have broken bones, unexplained broken bones, when they're being beaten, when they're being starved, things like that would be considered felonies and, and those would also be investigated. Now, animal cruelty is very tricky when it comes to investigating. Why? Our victims don't talk. They don't tell us what's happened to them. We rely on people to give us that information. And the problem is, a lot of times, this animal abuse is occurring behind closed doors, similar to child abuse. So the only people who are actually witnessing this are probably close friends, family members, or neighbors. And a lot of times, they don't want to come forward and put their name down on paper. They don't want to give us the statement. But they're willing to give us the information. So a lot of times, these investigations take a long time. Um, for us to gather enough evidence, for us to gather enough probable cause to make an arrest. 
When we do get that probable cause and we can make an arrest, one of the first things we're going to do, obviously, is get the animal medical attention. And we rely on our veterinarians heavily to give us a thorough exam of that animal to determine the level of abuse or neglect that the animal has suffered. Um, there's a lot of ways that they can tell us uh, how long the animal has been starved, if it's malnourished, how long the skin condition's been going on. Um, and they can also tell us how easily treatable that condition was, or maybe it was a condition that was more difficult um, that would have required more treatment. Um, so there's a lot of things that we do to, when we investigate animal cruelty. People are very passionate about animals, and we're very passionate about animals as well. And we do investigate all of our anonymous complaints, and we do the best that we can to try to prosecute uh, these cases when they do come across us. Sometimes animal abuse is not so cut and dry. We have people calling us all the time saying, well, my neighbor doesn't walk his dog. It doesn't really fall under animal cruelty. Is it right? No. I think all dogs should be walked. All dogs need fresh air. They need to go outside. They should be walked. That's their natural instinct is to roam. So they should be allowed to go out and walk on a leash with their owner. But there are a lot of people who just don't do that. It doesn't constitute animal abuse, though. And I think sometimes our public has a hard time with that. So a big part of our job is not just going out and arresting people. It's education. It's educating people. It's knocking on people's doors and saying, hey, you know the dog that's tied up in the backyard that, that looks kind of sad, that never seems to go for a walk? Why don't you put him on a leash and take him for a walk? Why don't you bring him inside the house once in a while and let him sleep in a nice warm dog bed? Um, and while we're on that subject of the dogs being tied up outside, there's also an anti-tethering law which prohibits people from tying dogs up outside for an unreasonable amount of time. So, <clears throat> Who determines what an unreasonable amount of time is? I know there's some dogs that like to be tied up outside, and then there's some dogs that are tied up outside indefinitely. There's never going to be a good time or a good excuse for tying your dog up outside indefinitely. Um, that's one of the biggest issues that we see is when animals, dogs get tied up outside and they're constantly just on that chain. Um, those are sometimes the dogs that we see that get those behavioral issues because they're never exposed to anything. They're never watched, they're never taken out, and they kind of go stir-crazy. So part of the anti-tethering law also helps us address some of these behavioral issues that we see because we can actually tell people, you can't do that anymore. You can't leave your dog tied up outside like that. The dog also has to have access to shade and fresh water if it's going to be tied up outside. And there's nothing that says that you can't tie your dog outside for a couple hours in the afternoon while you're home. We prefer that people don't tie their dogs up outside when they're not home because anything can happen. Somebody can come into the yard and let the dog loose. The dog can get, uh, you know, the dog can have some kind of an issue where, you know, it needs to be addressed. It is on a tether, so anything can happen. So we investigate everything. We ask all kinds of questions um, and we try to come up with reasonable solutions. We try to educate people. Like I said, in the event that we can't educate people and in the event that we find out that this neglect and the failure to, do, to take proper care of the animal has turned the tide and it actually is something that we have probable cause to make an arrest on, we will make an arrest. And then it's in the court's hands to decide what they do. So we're going to throw a lot of information at you today. I hope you enjoy this show. We are going to be doing an interview with a veterinarian. And then we're going to get her perspective on what she sees coming through her door and how she looks at the animals and how she's going to examine animals when they're brought in on suspected animal cruelty. So we hope you stay tuned, we hope you learn something, and we hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. So we're here with Dr. Christine Puskarek at the Compassionate Care Veterinary Hospital on the Berlin Turnpike in Berlin. So she's going to talk a little bit about what she's learned as she's going through your taking Veterinary forensics yes. now, right? Yes. Okay. The veterinary forensics certification course. Mm -hmm. Okay. So she's going to talk a little bit about what the difference is between uh, a forensic exam of an animal versus maybe just a regular exam. And we did bring in one of our, our dogs here, Petey, who looked like he had some skin issues. Um, he's a little bit thin coming in. So we want to, we want to get a better understanding of when um, neglect turns into abuse. Um, and when neglect can result in an arrest, because that's what this program is about, is um, not just caring for your pets, but making sure that if they have a condition that it doesn't get to the point where we would consider it abuse. Um, and so part of forensically examining the dog means that you would be able to tell 
perhaps how long his condition has been going on or how long maybe he's, he's maybe been malnourished or not fed enough. Is that correct? Um, it's a little bit hard to pinpoint time on a lot of the issues. I mean, what we're, what we're looking for a lot is um, um, trying to put together the pieces because we don't have a story with him. I mean, he was just found somewhere on the street and he's potentially a victim. And so we are now going to try and figure out, you know, was he cared for? And how can we look at him in that way to tell if he was cared for? Um, so we'll look at things like how he walks into the room. We start just immediately without even touching him. Is he jumping into the room, you know, bounding around, happy-go-lucky? Or is he cowering in the corner? Is he fearful when we approach him? It, does he seem like he's um, acting differently towards men in the room than he is towards women? Um, and then we're just going to get a general look at how he's walking. You know, is he lame? He can't tell us, oh, you know, somebody kicked him or somebody hit him or I may have been hit by a car. So we need to... Um, <laughs> he's having fun over there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. Um, so we need to um, look at all of those things and then just, you know, system systematically work through um, his body. And keeping in mind that if he is a victim, that there may be things that we need to take off of his body, um, you know, in case this does end up being a court case down the road, you know, if it's a, if it's a case of severe neglect or potentially abuse, um, our one chance to get evidence off of him, no different than how they would get it off of a crime scene, um, is when he first gets in here. Um, or even, you know, if we needed to at the site where, where he's found, you know, if it was in a home or something like that. Um, so that's kind of how we approach that. Now, I think this is great being a police officer because, like you said, uh, I think veterinarians are now getting more and more into this. I'm hearing more and more about forensic exams of animals because abuse is so prevalent, and I think we're now starting to take it seriously. And it's great that we have veterinarians now who are going to look at the animal, like you said, as evidence because... You know, back in the day, we just didn't have that. The animal would be brought in, and they would be treated, and it would be left up to law enforcement to try to draw some conclusions, which is hard because we don't have the medical background. So similar to um, a forensic exam of a human body, which would be done by a medical examiner who is a doctor, um, it's very similar to what you're doing for, for the animals here. So uh, do, now what made you want to take this the forensic course and start getting into this? Um, I think that... It's not something that, well, at least when I was in veterinary school, it's not something that was ever taught to us. And we do get a lot of animals that, that do come in and they're too skinny or they're even, you know, too fat. I mean, that can be a cruelty case as well. Um, and we were never taught, you know, what should we look for to identify that there may be a problem. And a lot of these animals may be coming in with, um, you know, with an owner who's abused. Um, and can't speak, you know, and is, or is afraid to talk and say what's going on in the home. And so we just go about doing our normal veterinary exams um, without really um, having the knowledge on how to process things through differently. Um, and that's kind of where, you know, um, we do a lot of work with the rescue groups here and with animal control. And we're seeing so many animals come in that are so skinny and, you know, their, their, their coats are horrendous and their nails are overgrown and they're matted. And it's, um, you know, got to a point where, you know, it's like this is not you know, this is cruelty, and how can I process this so that the people who have done this and neglected this animal, if they're caught, will pay for it? You know, because it's it's no different with animal abuse um, in, in the lot, eyes of the law. Um, you know, everything has to be documented, you know, everything, the pictures, the, the medical records, you know, legally, it's a very different approach than you know, a medical approach to records. So um, that's kind of, I just, I just wanted somebody to speak for the animals that potentially could have been abused or neglected that may not, you know, get their say because there's nobody there that knows how to process it. Right, and as I've said before, our victims don't talk, so we need this kind of an exam so that maybe what's happening to them on their bodies can actually tell us what's going on. So when, you, when people come in, um, when you have a client that comes in and you suspect, um, based on your exam, that there's abuse, will you contact animal control or the local law enforcement? I mean, is that something you do, or is there um, boundaries that maybe veterinarians won't cross when it comes to things like that? 
Um, me personally, I will, um, because in in the eyes of the law, um, it's not my job to prove animal abuse or neglect. If I suspect it, it is your job <laughs> to either exactly. prove or disprove it. And so if I have that high of a suspicion um, that I'm concerned about the well-being of an animal in its home, then I will bring it up to law enforcement. Every state is different as to whether they require um, uh, you know, the veterinarians to do that um, and whether they will protect them, you know, in, in, in the eyes of the law if, if it's, you know, if, if the reporting is inaccurate. Um, uh, so, um, but morally, I think I have a moral obligation to protect these animals and to report it if there's something I'm suspicious of, absolutely. Right, and just suspicion doesn't always mean a person is guilty. There could be other reasons for certain things happening. Um, I think what we see a lot is a lot of times maybe we have somebody who's elderly and just doesn't have the means to care for their pet. They don't have the transportation. Um, they don't have any assistance. And while some things that happen to the animals in those cases could be cruelty, uh, they can be addressed a different way, uh, just simply by getting people the assistance they need. But Obviously, um, especially in the urban areas, we do deal with, with an overpopulation of dogs. Um, we take in, like I said before, almost 200, between 250 and 300 dogs a year, which is a lot. It's a lot of dogs being thrown out, which in and of itself is, constitutes cruelty. And in addition to that, we see a lot of dogs that are typical of PD, which we're going to get to this exam here. Um, you know, whether it would be a case of cruelty or not, we don't know. He came in, he was very thin. Uh, we, from our observations, noticed uh, his ribs protruding and a little bit of his hip bones. He's actually put on a little weight since he's been with us. And, you know, his, his fur doesn't look good. It's very thin and spotty in, in areas. So we just figured, get him examined and find out what we can do to get him healthy. And then from your exam, maybe you would be able to see something that we're not seeing, obviously, because you're, you're more trained than we are. But it's, you know, we would probably be the first eyes on these dogs um, at our facility um, to take a look and say, yes, this, this is a dog that we really want to have examined. And then obviously the, the expert here would be able to tell us, yes, this is a case of, you know, this dog was abused or, or mistreated. Uh, very happy. <laughs> Yes, he definitely. <laughs> He's is. very happy. And sometimes just getting them out of the atmosphere they were in can lighten their mood, um, as we've seen that happen. Um, but let's let's go ahead and we'll get to a quick exam of uh, of PD over here, so everybody can see this this handsome man that we're talking about. Okay, so PD came into the room um, today, bouncing around, happy-go-lucky little guy. Um, he's he's super friendly, um, and typically what we do is we just start at the nose and work our way down. Um, so things that we're going to look for for signs of neglect are, um, you know, dental care. Um, are his teeth um, healthy? Um, does are they, you know, rotting out of his mouth? Does he have a lot of um, dental disease? Um, PD's teeth are healthy. Um, because we don't know anything about him, we're also going to use his teeth to kind of gauge his age as well. Um, we'll feel his lymph nodes. Um, we'll get to his um, hair coat, I think, probably last because that, that is an issue for him. Um, we're going to check out his eyes. Um, hi, bud. Sometimes this can stress dogs out. Um, so we're going to also kind of monitor how he responds to having his eyes looked at. He's just couldn't care less right now. Good boy. Um, we'll check out his ears for ear infections. Um, with with yeah. some animals with persistent ear infections, we can see a lot of problems with their ear um, flaps as well. Um, and um, with cats, we'll, we'll be checking for things like ear mites in their ears as well. look good. good We're going to take a listen to his heart, um, listening for heart murmurs, um, and his lungs. Scoot you over here, Pete. He's being a good patient. He's a good boy. We're going to palpate the abdomen. Um, some of these dogs that are out on the street um, or that are thin like Petey is um, are scrounging around for food wherever they can find it. And so um, feeling these abdomens are really important. Um, sometimes we can feel things like rocks or bones. Um, 
PD's abdomen feels okay, maybe a little bit gassy, um, probably because of the, um, the, the different foods he's been trying to find. Um, we're going to check his joints and his bones. Um, again, these guys can't tell us if they've been kicked or hit or um, beaten, um, and so we just feel everything. Um, if we know that this is probably going to be a criminal case, then we will actually x-ray the dogs because there can be a lot of older lesions, um, you know, maybe broken ribs um, that have healed that we won't be feeling or that may not be uncomfortable. Um, and that's another thing that we're doing is just feeling to see if he seems sore or tender anywhere. Um, and then the last thing we're going to do with PD, um, um, well, two things. We're going to give him a body condition score. Um, we, there is a scoring system from 1 to 9, 5 being ideal, um, 9 being obese, and 1 being completely emaciated. Um, PD, I would give a 3 um, uh, because he is underweight right now. You can easily see his ribs. He has a little bit too much of a waist in here, and he's a little bit too much tucked in. He easily should be about 10 pounds more than he is right now. Um, what we get a lot with these dogs is how long have they been skinny like this, and it's really hard to know um, because we never know where they started. Um, you know, we don't know if he was, you know, 50 pounds heavier and now he's this, or was he 5 pounds and he's been on the streets fending for himself. So it's really hard to know how long he's been underweight, but he definitely is um, malnourished. Um, and then we're looking at his hair coat, which is not, as you can see, is not healthy. He's got um, skin flaking off, he's got some bald patches here, he's got some crusted lesions. So um, what we want to do with these dogs um, in a forensic exam is collect everything. Um, so we would do um, skin cultures, we do skin scrapings, we would do fungal cultures um, to make sure that we get everything documented on him. So he ended up being a cruelty case. Um, we want to make sure that we, um, we document all of that. With the longer haired animals, we want to check their coats, make sure that they're not really matted. We want to check their nails. That can show neglect as well if their nails are overgrown. Um, we want to check them and see if they're um, intact or, um, or neutered, and PD is an intact male. Um, uh, so, um, you know, that's documented as well. Um, uh, and, and then, you know, if there are concerns about general health, we're going to do things like get blood work, um, you know, x-rays as we had discussed. Um, the x-rays not only can tell us if things have been broken, but also, you know, can document for these, these thin dogs what they have been eating. You know, are there rocks in this abdomen um, or sticks or anything like that that may show, um, you know, that he has been trying to fend for himself for a while. So um, we can also um, x-ray and find things like bullets, um, BBs, um, you know, to show that there maybe have been some potential abuse. Um, and then we also, um, you know, just want to check the animal over for scarring um, um, and injuries that may have happened. So per doctor's orders, PD here has to get a bath twice a week with medicated shampoo. Um, so it's a nice day for this. He's uh, pretty happy about having water on him, actually. How are you? It's probably a little strange. I'm sure Petey's never had a bath before. So we have a nice warm day. It's a good day for his bath. Get his medicated shampoo on here, which has to sit for a couple of minutes. Um, he went water? He's going to have a nice drink while we're uh, rinsing him here. Nice warm summer day, perfect for a nice bath. So we do take these dogs to the uh, veterinarian when we have these skin conditions come in. And if they need the baths, this is where they're going to get it. We're the only ones that are going to care for these dogs until they get into a home. Uh, so it's up to us to make sure that they heal properly. So we want to make sure we're doing everything that we can to get them healed. So baths and medication and proper nutrition all part of the regime to get this dog back to his uh, healthy weight and healthy coat. So hopefully within another uh, three or four weeks we'll see a big change in the way he looks uh, weight wise and coat wise. So, All right Petey, you did a good job. Yay! So Gabriel also needs a bath here. 
Um, you can see Gabriel's condition, even though it looks really bad, it's actually very much improved <laughs> since when he came here. So Gabriel was diagnosed with demodectic mange, um, which is a, a mite that attacks the skin. Uh, and if the dogs aren't getting proper nutrition, if they're malnourished, and if the condition isn't treated, it can really flare up and get to the point where uh, they have massive hair loss, scabbing and bleeding, and they're extremely uncomfortable. So when he came in here, uh, he was only 40 pounds. I believe he's slightly over 50 pounds now. So he was extremely underweight, malnourished, um, and all these bare spots on his legs, <laughs> high, and his, uh, his underbelly uh, were all scabbed and bleeding. So he spent a good amount of time at the veterinarian recovering um, because his case was extreme. It wasn't a, a, a case where we would want him here trying to recover. Uh, he really needed to be at the veterinarian to recover. Um, so they were able to put some weight on him and do some laser treatments on his skin to get the bleeding to stop and get some of those scabs off of him. Uh, but he is uh, healed tremendously but obviously he's not 100%. He's going to need care probably for the rest of his life for his skin conditions, um, whether that's medication or just uh, bi-weekly baths, which is what we've been doing for him. And he is still on medication. Um, you can see still some of the hair loss here, but it has grown back quite a bit. I mean, I've noticed a difference even in the past couple weeks. Um, big difference than when he first came in he didn't want you touching his feet. His feet were very raw. It, I can't explain it other than to say it looked like the worst sunburn on earth. Blistering and bleeding and extremely painful. Um, so Gabriel has come a long way. He does still have some scabs under his chin here. Um, so we want to make sure we get that really good. You want to make sure you avoid the eye area with these shampoos because they are medicated. You know, rub it on his belly. You got a bald belly, mister. He's very used to getting the baths. We've been doing them. And uh, luckily for him, it's summertime, so it's uh, nice and cool, nice and cool uh, for him to get a bath. The sun's nice and warm, huh, buddy? So this shampoo's going to have to sit on him for a couple minutes, so we're going to take him into the shade. Wait about 10 minutes. We'll rinse him off, and he'll be good to go. Like I said, this is something we're doing for him here twice a week in addition to his medications. It's been working and he, he looks fabulous. Right, buddy? On behalf of Petey and I, thank you for joining us for this episode of Animal 411. He's on his way to getting recovered and we hope that you learned something today. And we hope that if you see anything that you think constitutes animal abuse, you'll call it into your local animal control. Here in New Britain, routine calls can be called into 860-826-3000, or you can write down the number that's being flashed across your screen right now. Thank you again for joining us in this episode of Animal 411. Good boy.